What's up, everybody? Troy Cartwright here. Welcome back to Ten Year Town. Thank you guys so much for all the love on the Q and A episode. We love doing them and answering your questions. And uh, we're gearing up for our first live event in 2024. So make sure you join the Ten Year Town community at tenuretown.com. Thanks. Today's guest is the legendary Harry Myrie. And depending on which side of the internet you're on, you might know him from his popular YouTube channel, from seeing him behind the kit at a Hardy show, or from his TEDx Nashville talk. Harry is a drummer, but he's also a deep thinker and honestly one of the most interesting guys I've ever met. We talked today about his thought process on building an audience, how he forged his own path to get his start as a touring drummer, and a million other tangents along the way. I love this guy. And I know y'all are going to love this episode. Without further ado, here he is, Harry Myrie. Is that camera pointed at, at you because you're the peanut gallery or something? I've never seen that angle before. Uh, that angle is not normally on. Okay. You know? Yeah, I never saw that before. But I it's only, just there. I only saw the three. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a, uh, it's quite the setup in here, you know? Yeah, dude. Um, man, I, what's, what's going on? How's, how's your day today? I used to get, um, uh, today's sentimental. Okay. I, I didn't realize I'd been in this building before, but I used to get massages in here, dude. <laughs> 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 I still had a GPS to get here. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, well, as you know, we normally start this thing off with the same question, which is, uh, how long have you been in town, Harry? 10 years. I put my face on the podcast. No dude. way. On the dot. 10 years right not, now. Not today. Uh, it was August. It was close. a crossfade. I crossfaded from Boston to here. When I first got here, I had a rental house. Okay. It, but was having to go back and forth to Boston. It was like still. How, like how often? Oh, once a week, dude. I was like, oh, wow. I still had classes and stuff. Oh, yeah. I had not graduated yet when I started my uh, rental house here. Okay. So what, so you moved here. Did you have like a whole semester left at Berkeley? It was just the the um, the last tinges of the summer there, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what year was this? Twenty thirteen. Okay, so why I would have, I would have been gone by then. From Berkeley, just barely. And in Dallas at that point. Uh, yeah, I just I moved to Dallas. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I moved to Dallas, January of twenty thirteen. People need to know there was a New York phase in here for you. Too. Yeah, I know. Well, you know. Someday, someday we'll tell my life story, but that day is not today. When you have been in Nashville for 10 years, can someone interview you and you sit in this chair? Yeah, what we're going to do is we're just going to find the best guests we've ever had and then have them come interview me for 10 years. This is my audition to interview <laughs> yeah, so Troy Cartwright no pressure. Cartwright on 10 Year Town, dude. No pressure, I've bro. been preparing my whole life for this. <laughs> um, all right. 10 years, came from Berkeley. Uh, I know... I know so. I know so much. Uh, you know, for for those listening at home, me me and Harry have been great friends for a long time. I feel like we've just been having a conversation for about five years straight. <laughs> We'd never finished one. But I know yeah, we haven't. We have many chainsaws, and this is one of my favorite things about my relationship with you. Now. <laughs> we won't finish today either. No, it will never be done. But uh, for for those uh, that that don't know you as well as I do, kind of. Um, how how would you say that you're even before moving to Nashville? How did, how did you get wrapped up in all this? Man, I wasn't wrapped up in anything <laughs> until I was 12 years old okay. and knew by then for a fact that I was just meant to suck at everything. <laughs> and I went to a mandatory school assembly and there was this dude playing the saxophone. Yeah. He had like a student jazz band in there and he played a saxophone on the Aretha Franklin respect the sax solo in the middle of that song. And I thought maybe I wouldn't suck at that. And I found him in the hallway a few days later and like tugged on his shirt and was like, dude, can you show me how to make a saxophone, make that sound? Yeah. And he did. And that was like the first day of the rest of my life. Really? All the way to right now in this chair. Wow. It was, it was, so the, the saxophone was the, was the gateway drug. Dude. <laughs> yeah. I, that's what got me in the, the band and the band had a drummer. Yeah. If you play horns, you know, like in that context anyway, 
you have half the gigs, like I think they call them long rests. Okay. That's how out of academic music practice I am, but they just draw a long bar and they write a 16 over it. Yeah. Yeah. And you count 16 bars. No and doubt. I, I would notice like 64 bars later, I never came back in. I was just watching the drummer, <laughs> dude. And I go home and play on pillows and stuff. So yeah. that took months. That wasn't years of ruminating. That was like within a couple of months of playing the saxophone, I was a drummer. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So you start drumming. I'm guessing like, uh, okay, you're like 12, 13. So it's got to be like Blink and Blink-182. And what what was the... Dude, what was it, man? We are so lucky that that was the zeitgeist when we were <laughs> forming our sense of selves. I know. Do you like? Did Blink tell you who you are too? Oh, a hundred percent. But I'm. But there's something deeply wrong with me where, like, as soon as like I realized that everyone liked it, I of course was like, oh no, I like something else. I had to figure out what that was. You know what I mean? Man, that that was a counterintuitive challenge for punk music or pop punk at that time it's like that was pop music i know 2001 isn't that bizarre warp tour was like a place you go if they had iphones then that would be like a place you go to take a selfie and put it on your instagram a hundred percent and you don't know the sum 41 songs but you just wanted to be near it because that seems like it's important or something but now warp, warp tour is over now but if you had gone to the last one or something, the last one I went to was 2016. Okay. Nobody was there for any reason other than <laughs> I love this music. Yeah. They, yeah, that does not, that would never, like we, we have, uh, when we were young fest, which is just warp tour now. Dude. And it's like, it is, it's like, it's like overrun with, with influencers and that's fine. Chase your bliss, you know? Yeah. I, at the, um, at the heart of, Man, the guys that make it, Blink included. If yeah. you go to a Blink show, did you see them this year? No, I didn't okay, go. Okay, they're going to give you another chance in 2024. Okay. You and everybody else listening <laughs> that missed out on this. Needs to go. Yeah, um, because that is that is where they came from. Like, yeah. they, they did not make that stuff for... They made that stuff because they loved it. Yeah. That might sound trite, but you can tell when, you, when the three of them are on stage. Um, they have dedicated their lives to that... Southern mm. California skateboarding, everything's dude. Yeah. Sound familiar? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there's only one pickup in the electric guitar, and he barely knows how to play it, but it was about the ethos. It was not about it was what just, he was doing on the fretboard. Yeah, it was the energy, man. Dude, and that's an, that's an opportunity for people like me that I don't. I always felt like the least musically skilled guy in every like trained circle that I ran in yeah. at school or whatever. I, but... Um, I cared just as much. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, if you see a band like that and you go, yeah, that was enough that we just had a point of view, that right. we had something to say at all, that made me go like, okay, well then me too. And I've been fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's something that I feel like you, you learn when you get to a place like Berkeley, right? It's like you find out very quickly, in my case anyway, you are not, at all the best musician, not even close. You're probably like not even in the top 50% of like musically talented best musician. But I also quickly realized like it didn't matter because I had, you know, songs to sing and, and a point of view. And I was not interested in like shedding, <laughs> hitting the shed, you know, and practicing. I was just interested in like trying to make dope music yeah man you i i have always thought of you this way you had something to say and you just if yeah. anything you went there saying yeah how do i make the vehicle i'm i'm ready to go yeah yeah is that fair to say yeah but still still assembling the vehicle these days well the thing breaks <laughs> down man stuff falls <laughs> off of it and we got to put new stuff on it yeah i feel that too that's a very cyclical yeah yeah no doubt on my way here i knew you were gonna ask how long have you been here and i thought 10 years i did it wow. but i also like I feel myself at the beginning of so much stuff mm. right now. I realize like, oh, everything has a 10 year cycle to it or something. Yeah. In some stuff, regardless of how long we've been here. I even thought about it a little bit when Chris McHugh came here and was saying his stuff. He got here in 1988 or whatever, but he, yeah. dude, like cycles, he's, man, he's juggling a bunch of 10 year chainsaws too. Like, no uh, doubt. That inspires me to go like, oh yeah, we're still beginners in a bunch of ways too. Yeah. If we're lucky, we get to begin more and more new that's stuff. That's right. That's right. We, uh, uh, we're always looking for, um, another throw of, of the bone, so to speak, you know, we're just trying to chase it down. <laughs> I, yeah. I feel that. Wow. What a wordsmith you are, man. Um, 
I did not. My buddy, uh, my buddy Martin Johnson told me that one time. He said, that's what we're all looking for, Troy. It's just another throw of the bone. Was Martin the singer of Boys Like Girls? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is, he, is it fair to say he's a songwriter? Absolutely. This is why I want to hang with songwriters all day, every day, <laughs> because this is how y'all speak, man. One yeah. more throw of the bone. That's right. Um, well, so you alluded to moving here from, from Boston. Uh, you, uh, you were at Berkeley and like, tell, tell me a little bit about like finding out about like, how did you even find out that Berkeley was a place for you and existed? Do you remember? Yeah, I remember perfectly. I don't mean to, um, abuse the reference, but same guy that stood in front of the school and played the sax solo. Yeah. Like years into our little trip where he, he was Yoda and I was, I don't know, maybe Yoda trained some, Luke is the one we know about, but yeah, he probably yeah. trained some other chumps. Absolutely. And so we were in the swamp for enough years that he thought, this guy really gives a shit about music. Okay. I promised myself I wasn't going to say the word shit when it's, I came in here. It's okay. Okay. It's quite all right. All right. Trust as how, much as you want. <laughs> see how far <laughs> we take that. I, that's how I talk. I, Dude, yeah. um, it doesn't, it's, it's, you should just feel comfortable. We went a few years down that road and he thought, this kid is really engaged in this music stuff. So he um, persuaded me. He t I had never heard of Berkeley before him. Yeah. Dude, if you grow up in Alabama, they, they will swear that music in a professional capacity does not exist. <laughs> yeah. You, you can either, where I grew up anyway, you can either care about college football or church or something. Those right. are the two things that I remember being like endorsed by adults. When right. I, yeah. When I grew up. Didn't feel like there were a lot of options. Yeah, man. And so, I, and so this, yeah. Did you describe sax as a gateway drug? That's exactly <laughs> what it was. Like, yeah, this was some dude um, out of some alleyway or something. And he wasn't, he wasn't like the rest. I, I'm so thankful he ended up in Alabama. He didn't belong there. Yeah. And was this like a, was this like a teacher or a student yeah. or it was a teacher? Yeah. He was the music teacher at this little school that I oh, went to. Wow. He was from Chicago. He had lived a bunch of places. He knew the whole world. I think most people I grew up around thought that Alabama was the whole world, that yeah. the whole world was that way. Sure. And he was one of the early adults in my life to show me other ways. Yeah. And he said, um, Berkeley, which I didn't know what that meant. I didn't even know it was a college. It was just a, a thing that he told me I should be interested in. And he said they had this world scholarship tour. Do you remember this? Uh, the world yeah. scholarship tour. Did yeah. you do it? No, it but came, I, it was like, they would come to different cities, right? Yes. And you would like audition. And not the shit town I grew up in, yeah. but it came to Atlanta, which was sort of my, that was the closest like civilization yeah, that yeah. I grew up next to. So if I wanted to see like awesome concerts or something, I'd go to Atlanta and I hitched a ride to Atlanta uh, with him to do this world scholarship tour. And I got like a little, I, I was 15, I think when I did that. Okay. So they gave me a baby scholarship to go to um, five a week. summer program, five week. Yeah. Did you ever do that? No, I, I like everything else. It seems this is like a, a, a theme in my life and I've, I've made my, my peace with it. But like, I, I'm always finding out about things like, way later. So I heard about five week when I was like in college already. Right. But for those, uh, just that don't understand, like five week is this thing at Berkeley where like they basically let high school students come pretend they're in music college for like a month, which if I could have done that at 16, bro, like, or 15, mm -hmm. I can't, that would have been the greatest thing of all time, but I just didn't know about it. As socially charming as you are. Yeah. You would have ruled there. <laughs> I, I went and uh, I slept all day. And I guess this is a simulation of college. Yeah. I slept all day in the dorm. And then at night, when everybody went to sleep, I'd be wired awake and just I'd walk around in sketchy parks with a, I still had a disc man. Yeah. And so you could only listen to 55 music, minutes of music or whatever, just right. on repeat. And so I'd, I tended to I don't know if, to this day, I don't know a very wide variety of music, but the music that I do know, very deep. I know when they have like quit playing for a second to scratch the back of their head and then keep playing. Like I know all the little, yeah. and a lot of it came from just walking around insomniac in, yeah, in yeah. Boston, listening to this stuff. And uh, you, you had 24 seven access to practice rooms, go in and shout all the time. Even yeah. if you weren't a practicer, you just have 
that place gives you the instinct to just play all the time. Yeah. And, and the other drummers would leave their doors cracked up and you'd hear them play inhuman stuff. And then mm -hmm. that would accidentally get into your playing. And yeah, it, ch it changed me. But just, yeah, just five weeks, just for five weeks, being around other people who cared as much about this stuff as I did. That's the first time in my life I ever met anybody that like yeah. really found their identity in, in music. No doubt, man. And it wasn't even a dream. It was just a, of course, this is what I do. Like, that's what the people were like that I met there. And yeah. I'm so thankful for that. That just opened the door to a sense that maybe there are people like that in the world. Maybe I can find them. Yeah. Fast forward to right now in Nashville, like my life is full of these people, man. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's like, this is, I always compare Nashville when I discovered like this, songwriting culture and like musician culture here in Nashville, I was like 26. And it was like, I had crashed on the island of misfit toys. I was like, these are my people. Dude. I didn't even know that these people were here. That how, did, how did I miss this dude? for so long? Yeah, that you know? secret island feeling. Yeah. As I, as I heard myself say all this out loud to you, I realized now a little bit deeper into adulthood, if it's even fair to call us that. Yeah, I think, I think you're In adult. terms of age, we are adults, but emotionally, yeah. that's the part I'm questioning. <laughs> right, right. But I, I feel, I, as I heard myself say that out loud to you, now I'm going like, I actually feel myself trying to zag the other way now and puts like reinstall some people into my life that don't see music as the whole I know. bit. It's just that constant, it's that constant building, rebuilding the car, dude. Yes. That's, yeah. That's what it is. At weddings or whatever, if some musician walks up, I go, hold that thought. And I try and find somebody that's like in the military. Yeah. Or I need, I need somebody that's like an accountant. Dude, yeah. Or like works like like runs like a oil change business. Like just just a real normal. I'm trying to hang out with some plumbers, dude. <laughs> like just some some regular job. I feel like those people might have it figured out. <laughs> I think I mean something along those lines. Yeah, just people that understand that there's yeah, it's Alabama syndrome again. I just I want to be around people who understand there's like more to the equation than this one little thing that we fixate on all the time. Yeah. He says on a podcast about that. <laughs> I realize that the point of this hour is to fixate on it. So we will, but I yeah. just wanted to offer that of too. Of course. That that's just what's rattling around. Well, it's, here. it's a, it's a, ultimately it's some kind of psychosis that we have that we're just love this thing this much, you know? <laughs> yeah. In spite of all the, the, uh, ridiculous, whatever things that have been thrown in front of us along, along the journey. Right. You're right. That is, the, no, this really is the sincere sound of our psychosis yeah. of this is everything, <laughs> but also must get away from it, man. Like the only way to sanity is to yeah. abandon it or something. I, I know. I know. It's, yeah. And you've dude, you've caught me right in the middle of, I ordinarily, I noticed this in myself on, on my way in here today too. Ordinarily when I sit on a mic, it's because there's something to, promote or something. And, yeah. um, I am here right now talking to you just in the middle of all those chainsaws are mid air right now, man. This yeah. is like a nice time to take the temperature, but that's what it sounds like. It is very, what did you, what word did you use? Psychosis? Yeah. There's psychosis right now, man. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, I, I, I go through all these different periods of feeling like everything is roses. It's coming up roses. It's all working. And then I get into like what I would call very like depressive periods where I'm like, nothing works mm. and it's all horrible. And I think we're constantly just trying to find like, there's danger on both of those sides, right? Like, so it's just trying to find that, that middle place where you can ride and nobody ever gets to just be right in the middle all the time. It doesn't work that way. But I've just been trying to make my peace with like letting it just enjoying the ride a little bit, you know? Yeah, I get what you're saying. That that is um that sort of nirvana in the middle is a is a state that you just pass through I know. as you're balancing <laughs> the seesaw. Yeah. And yeah, and so where you, I think what you're saying is where you, what you're trying to get comfortable with is that motion to and from that threshold over and over yeah, again. Yeah, this 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 is the right. It's okay that this is the yeah, right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay. Well, that's um, the sense I get from sitting with you right now is that you're embracing that ride. Well, today you know, should have talked to me two days ago. Was, <laughs> yeah. Take us into that, man. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying it's always, a, it's always, a, a, you know, it's constantly moving the mood and how you feel and all that. I feel that too. And I, I buy in so hard when I know everything is ruined. I, like I, I do get convinced of that. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. But then you, you wake up the next day and it's like, ah, yeah, it's actually fine. 
Dude, well, I, it, it turns us all into, like, you see this a lot in the addict community. Like, it makes you become functionally spiritual or something, mm. where you start reciting these, um, what do you call them, mantras or something, this too shall pass. Yeah. You know, some Shakespearean sounding, like, yeah. stuff that would sound trite when you're studying it in eighth grade. And then when you suffer a bunch for decades or something, I don't mean to act like I have... Um, had an undue amount of suffering for decades or whatever, but everybody, everybody has, man. dude. Yes. Don't, like, don't diminish like that. Like suffering is, is a part of your life. You know? Well said it the suffering is a part of everybody's it life. Is. And then you, within the next time you hear yourself go, this too shall pass. You're like, Oh, thank you God. Or whatever, <laughs> whatever your higher power is. Right. Yeah. That stuff means more and more the it more is. we slam our faces repeatedly into the concrete or something. Yeah. It's um, funny to me about this conversation. I want to hear whatever you were about to say or ask. Yeah. But I I feel both of us characterizing this as misery or something. And that's funny because that made hearing us talk like that about it, it made me scan like, oh, is this miserable? And I'm like, no, we love this. Yeah. I don't mean to speak for you, but like, yo, if you told me I couldn't do this anymore, I would I would beg you to that's let right. me stay. Another, you want another throw, dude. So I don't, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I don't mean to spend this entire hour going like this is um, untenably hard yeah, or something. Yeah. Like no. I, I love this stuff, man. Me too, bro. Okay. Um, and I want to, I just kind of want to like click in on some of that stuff for you. So like, uh, you know, you have done so uh, many different things in your career, which have all centered around drumming for the most part. Um, but... You know, I, I, I think one of the things that I it, have always admired about you is you kind of have a different, I don't know, I feel like you're, you have a different way of, of doing things. Um, and uh, like, I, I guess I would love to sort of start somewhere and I'm just picking random things that I know that I remember, right? But like, you have randomly like a quite successful YouTube channel but unlike most people I know that have some sort of creative and successful like content stream, you also like have a very unique uh, take on posting to it in that you don't really post all that often. And I think that that's really fascinating. So like why, why did you start it? And what is your philosophy behind whatever making content as we call it now you've struck a chord man <laughs> i do have passion about this subject all right but i don't beat people over the head with it it's just like a little religion that i keep to myself i i want to i want to be proth proselytized <laughs> too <laughs> well when i see other people recognize it and ask about it, i'm like oh it that helps me connect to it more too because it was a guess. I've all, the way that I feel about this stuff, which I'll explain. Yeah. I always felt this way, but I didn't have the proof that it was an okay way to think about that stuff until I had the fortune with that stuff that I had. So yeah. to address your first question right away, how did that start? Twofold. Number one, I'm a YouTube fan more than I'm a YouTube creator. Okay. I, um, I, can, I can remember it as far back as 05, 06 the days of Zay Frank, where there were just, if that felt like we were talking about punk rock earlier, and I can't even remember if that was on the mic or not, but I, um, to just review that ethos a little bit, some of the most beautiful punk music was just people making stuff for the sake of having made it. Yeah. And YouTube being this sort of indie or punk thing that it started as, if you look at a lot of the uh, vlogs from 2006, it's just sort of these dweebs point, pointing a camcorder, a 90s camcorder at themselves going, I know nobody's going to see this, but I think this is fun. Yeah. And so I'm doing it for me or whatever. And that's like the Zay Frank or even a little bit later than them vlog bros. These guys just making videos that they knew they were throwing into a black hole never to be seen again. And then, like you said about your island of misfit toys, they just found all these other dweebs online that were watching and yeah, commenting and then people found it. making videos in response to one another. And I was part of, as a consumer, I mean, I was a part of that movement, yeah. watching that stuff. And so I, I, that, that feels like my native culture. And when my, when, when my band, um, when my band Boom City started, when we started getting money, yeah. like record contract money to make our stuff, um, 
I remember we had the opportunity to spend a bunch of it in a recording studio with a fancy producer, or we could f spend it on like toys that yeah. we could make videos with yeah. in our house and put like a green screen up and do stupid stuff like act like we ate Nyan Cat flavored Pop Tarts and then we all turned into Pop Tarts or whatever. I don't, it's, <laughs> you know, it like, because we were part of that, just as consumers, we were part of that conversation and yeah. we thought, there's enough music on shelves or in Spotify or whatever without any identity beyond that. We're just, we're just going to start making our noise in videos and that's going to be how people connect to us. And it was so, I don't mean to say it was easy. Like we didn't stay up all night working on things all the time, but yeah. it was easy to stay up all night working on these things. Like, because we were just, we had that sort of Zay Frank self amusement. Like we are making this, whether anybody sees it or not, we just. Well, yeah. Was, because you're making it for you and you cared about it. Yeah. And nobody else was doing it. Yo, in yes. your, you know, in your little vertical of music slash like whatever content. Yeah, you know? I, dude, it was, that was the fuel. And that yeah. was, that is renewable energy, man. No doubt. Like it was infinitely easy to, to do that. The, uh, there are hard parts about being in a band, getting four people on the same page. So when that band went down in flames, I didn't miss uh, radio politics or, all this, all this baggage that you're so good at with artistry, man. Like I, I didn't, I didn't miss uh, my face being on the poster or something. Yeah, I did miss making videos. Wow. The and 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 drumming, like that's the part I wanted to keep. Yeah. I didn't know this would be the definition of Nashville for me, but I remember leaving that band going. I just want to play the drums. Somebody just hand me the drum part and say, "Shut your mouth and play this." That's like the definition of my life now in Nashville, dude. <laughs> Um, that's my Island of Misfit toys here. So, yeah. um, I wanted to hang on to that part and I wanted to still make videos. I look, I liked the feeling of that. And when I first got to Nashville in my U-Haul, I remember stopping at the guitar center on the, in Berry Hill here Yeah, on my way to that rental house 10 years ago. And the guy at the counter hands me my hardware, whatever I was going to play in Nashville. And we get to talking and I remember, I've told this story before. I remember him saying, um, what are you doing here? Yeah, I said, I had just moved to Nashville. What about you, man? And I, I'm going to play the drums. You know, and what about you? He goes, yeah, I just moved here from Chicago six years ago, just still looking for the gig. And yeah. I remember asking everyone that would say that, the barista and everybody that I met or the Uber driver or whatever. Yeah, they're all just like, I moved here to play drums. Been here a couple of years, just waiting on the gig. I would ask all of them, where can I check out your playing? Where can I see you or listen to you or whatever? Mm. And they all went, well, there's a demo. It's on cassette though. All right. And the thing is, the bass player was like sick that day. So his time is not that good. And uh, you know what I mean? There's yeah. all this qualifying of like, nobody said like, oh, right here. Like, well, look at this Dude, video. I hate, I hate qualifying things. If I have to, if I have to send something to someone and I have to qualify it, I'm like, I'm not going to send it. Just redo it until it doesn't need an explanation. Yeah. I realize that's easier said than done. And one thing that compounds that pressure, I have noticed, the more I work th on things that have piles of money involved mm -hmm. you get these dudes with clipboards going like i don't care what it takes it has to come out on tuesday october the 24th <laughs> you know what i'm saying it's like why uh, i always i always go but does it <laughs> <laughs> um well like, what, as the what person if we pushed it a week yo as the person creating the thing you have that power yeah. i've learned that from working on some of this stuff yeah um and if you yeah if you are convicted that you don't um you do care if it's good. You don't care if it, if it, um, if it has to be bad to come out, that's fine with you. If it never comes out. Yeah. There's a real primal state with creative stuff that you can enter into where it does not matter if all of, I don't want to name a management firm or something, but all of that giant conglomeration of managers or whatever, if all of them are waving their clipboards at you saying like, you're about to miss out on $360,000 if you don't turn this in on time, or we're going to blow this deal or whatever. Um, you, if if the most important thing to you is that it's good, you can go. Yeah, that's fine. Keep mm -hmm. the money. I I'm not doing it unless it's going to be good. Yeah. And it, deadlines are just so at the expense of that. Sometimes yeah. I know I know these clipboard dudes have their frustrations too because they're like, man, creative people don't know what day it is. They don't know what time it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They don't know how to get to damn the damn airport. Right. Um, it's a balance. The answer, like everything else is like, it's probably somewhere in the middle and it depends what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. I, cause there's some nuance, um, to be understood too about, um, 
Yo, if you, uh, that like perfect is the enemy of good or something. If you, yeah. if you chisel away at it too much, then, um, we're all dead and it never came out because it was never perfect enough to release right, or whatever. Right, right, I don't, right. I'm, I'm guilty of that side of the coin too. Um, the, as this all relates to making stuff. Yeah. Oh, the qualifying. That's what set us off on that. Yeah. I mean, I just, I realized right away that everybody I met here that didn't have a gig because they were sitting here going, they're doing the qualifying thing that we were talking about. Yeah. And I thought, cool. I, I'm, I'm not even going to say I'm a drummer to anybody until I have a video that I like of what it looks like and sounds like and mm. feels like for me to play the drums. Yeah. And so all what little money I had, um, I paid this lovely videographer $25 an hour to come to my house and just point, uh, um, a Canon rebel at me. Yeah. And I recorded myself playing a song and I did it once a week, man. I just kept putting them up over and over again. And I, and I, I just wouldn't put it up unless I thought, yeah, I like the way this sounds and looks and feels. Yeah. And people would ask like, oh, are you a drummer? Let me see. And I go, boom, no qualifying. Was it, were you, did you have your kit like mic'd up and everything? Yeah. Or was it like literally like camera audio? <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah. I see. I, I was not willing for it to be like distorted iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. Camera. yeah. yeah. No, you, I mean, I'm just trying to like get a, get a better picture of it. I mean, yeah. that's, that's so smart though. That's such, such an obvious thing to do that. I feel like so many people would never think to do. You cannot believe even now in 2023, how hard it is, you know, you'd be looking for some, uh, someone for, for a gig, whether it's a drummer or a guitar player or whatever. And you're like, here's a list of names and you go look them up and it's like, there's no videos of them playing their instrument. I don't like what, <laughs> this is like the one useful thing that social media is for. It's not even here, you know? Dude, it's and there, therein lies the opportunity Yeah, for everybody on earth listening to this right now going, how will I stand out? Just do the bit, like you already know within yourself how great it looks, sounds, and feels when you play the drums. Now just make a camera see that yeah. and then make the rest of us see it. Right. That is not, that is not out of reach. No, it's not. Um, it's hard work, but it's not that hard. I, I made some duds. I mean, the other thing I was thinking about when you asked, like, well, hey, was was the kit mic'd up? I realized that I have oversimplified this even in my own mind because I have videos dating back to 2008 mm -hmm. of me, like, where the, at that time, the accessible, the GoPro of the time, it was called Flip. You remember oh, Flip yeah, cameras? I, remember okay. flip. I had three Flip cameras and the, the angles were terrible. And uh, <laughs> yeah, the audio went straight in yeah. and... Um, and the playing wasn't good and the look wasn't good and the angles weren't good. And, but I, I realized from having this sort of extended conversation about it with you, how many failed Wright brothers airplanes I got to make before I came to Nashville and made one that actually like yeah. caught air, man. Yeah. So th those early, uh, th that stuff that I made when I first got to Nashville, it's still on YouTube right now. Wow. I wish me it's, if something bugs me over the years, I've become uh, disillusioned with it. I'll take it down. Yeah. But some of that early stuff that got me my first gigs here, it's still sitting there. Like I'm and that, still. And that so that your your hypothesis worked, of I'm going to make this stuff, and it's going to get me gigs. Yes, because of what you're saying. Yeah. Like because it just made it that easy. People go like, "Old, well, can the guy play?" It's like you tell me. Here's the. Video. <laughs> I'm not saying. And by the, this connects back to our earlier part of our conversation too. This doesn't have anything to do with me playing any better than everybody else who moved here in 2013. It has nothing to do with that. Sure. I, I knew, I'm in a whole class full of drummers who moved here in 2013. And I, I do sincerely consider myself in the bottom of the pack as far as um, how beautiful it sounds or looks or feels when I play the drums. But, mm. the, um, but we all, and dude, I, I feel lucky also that, because this matters um, as you go on your journey here, you want your incoming class to succeed. Yeah. So I'm not saying I left anybody in the dust either. Like you, we each pull each other up. Absolutely. That's, uh, that is like one of the most important lessons that, you know, you have to learn is that it's not, it's competitive, but you know, as you go along, you want people around you to start having success because it will, I promise you, it will bring you success, right? Like some one of your drummer buddies like has to leave a good gig for another, maybe it's a great gig. Like they're going to call you to yeah. fill the spot. Ho hopefully. Yeah, dude, that that's the obvious stuff. Yeah. And there, there's, there's, I think there's also like tribal 
unconscious stuff that's harder to recognize where we're all just, all of us on this trip, we're like, we're all sort of affiliated with one another. Mm -hmm. And the more everyone in your tribe succeeds, the more like your stock price accidentally inflated because of that. Does that make any sense? Yeah. 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 You you get some of that transitive, transitive success properties. (laughs) Dude, yeah, that's a Jew. That's what I'm saying. That's what yeah. I'm saying. And um, so be nice to everybody, man. But also aside from the gains on the other end of that, just be nice to everybody anyway. But, <laughs> uh, I, but, but all I meant to say about those videos early on is I, I understood when I was doing that, that everybody else was out in bars and they were drinking with each other and making friends and all stuff, which is, um, that's part of how you make headway here too. Yeah. And I did make this bet, like, I'm going to do this weirdo, this thing that's always been a part of me, like making videos. I was trying to feed that beast in me anyway. So um, that's how I did it. And I didn't know if that was going to make a difference, but everything um, in my life that feels comfy to lay on and keeps me warm, it all came from me making those damn videos, dude. (laughs) I can't can't point out anything that's going well in Nashville, professionally for me that is not directly wow. connected to having made YouTube videos. Man. That's crazy. Yeah. That's just, that's almost unnerving. Like, damn it. I didn't, I sort of do that on a whim. I was just <laughs> guessing. It was, I mean, I, I'm a try hard. I, I've, um, I gritted a whole plan for how to make all that stuff and I believed in it, but I just, I, there was no proof that that was going to work. Yeah. And it, your other question was given all that context, your, your other question was, uh, what's up with the posting so seldom? Mm-hmm. Um, and you're right that that is intentional. And the, the reason has changed over the years, but early on, my in 2014, I promised myself I would make a video every Monday, no matter what. Yeah. And one reason for this is at that time, maybe this is still true. At that time, if you were to Google how to do good on YouTube or fill in the blank with any social media platform, yeah. you would find a bunch of, SEO experts going, you know how you do it is you flood the place Mm -hmm. with your face everywhere. People look, they see your face all the damn time, man. And when they shut their eyelids, they see your face on the back of their eyelids, man. Now go make content, capital C content. And, um, so I remember even as, even that long ago, I remember them hammering consistency. That was just like the, um, the the whole, uh, that was the agreed upon wisdom of how to do this. Yeah. And, Looking back, I am glad I made a video every Monday in 2014 in the sense that it helped me make a lot of dumb decisions really quickly and get them out of the way mm-hmm. in the dark. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Nobody cares if you fail in the dark. No, well, yeah, 100%, bro. Okay. I know exactly what you mean. And so I made some shitty shit <laughs> in the dark, man, yeah. in 2014. And, uh, but, you know, a, cu- a couple of those jelly beans like kind of rolled. Yeah. And uh, people ate them and they liked them. Right. But but yeah. But uh, I want to tack on to that a little bit. It's odd. I find that I like to create specifically content creation, right? Making stupid TikToks or whatever for my artist stuff. Like I find I'm better when it's in the dark. When I start thinking about all the people that are going to see these videos, I feel like I actually make worse content because I'm like trying to like, I'm back to trying to get the kids in high school to like think I'm cool. Mm. It was better when I knew it was all my first like big successes on TikTok were like, I knew it was in the dark and then they just went viral because, but I just didn't care. Right. When I was making them, I was like, well, nobody's going to see this anyway. So might as well send it. <laughs> of course. Intellectually, we both go, of course, that's true. Of course, that's true. That's Yo, right. Yeah, that's back to there's really one person in the audience and that one person is you. Yep. Make something that you yep. can't live without having made. That's Intellectually, right. Intellectually, we know this 100% of the time. Yeah. The other part of it, there's like a, what is it, the id? That's that's the part that makes us go like, oh my God, everybody in the high school needs to love us. <laughs> Wait, I will right. sacrifice myself to make everybody in the high school uh, love me. Yeah. And yeah, that's in all of us, man. Yeah. That's good to say that out loud. Mm-hmm. I um, I realized from making a bunch of shitty shit in 2014 that if I was just going to delete it anyway and be embarrassed that it was there, imagine any shitty thing that you make, like that's the first 
impression you ever made on some rando they happen to see. Yeah. Whatever terrible thing I made. I realized really quickly, like, oh, I, I don't want people to see my face all the time. I didn't realize to like turn away from that conventionally held wisdom about putting stuff online. I went, I actually don't care if people never see me or rarely see me. All I really want to control is when they do, I mint it. What they mm. saw, I'm in with it. Yeah. And I d am not the guy behind the counter going like, oh yeah, but that day they just, you know, there was, and then Taco Bell or whatever. Yeah, you, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you wanted it, you wanted it to be, uh, you wanted it to matter each time. Yeah, dude. And so I started taking it longer and longer between making things. And, and by the, I, this, I want to say this out loud to everybody who makes stuff here too. This unsure about this. For, speaking from my experience, by the time you go three months and you haven't made shit, you know by the end of the third month, no one remembers that you existed and it's over and you squandered all hundreds <laughs> of thousands of your subscribers and they've moved on because you didn't keep them. You're looking at your screen, man. Yeah. And you know that it's over. It, but you've just made this thing, and so you put it out anyway, and they were still there, man. <laughs> They're so delighted to see you, man. If you cultivated an audience that gives a shit about your thing in the first place anyway, they are still here. They still love you. Dude, but that's so that's so the opposite of, like, what whoever they is want us to believe, whether that's, like, the social media gods or this this town like a like the labels or whatever the conventional wisdom is got to be out there every day bro you got to be posting and this is true if the game you are competing at is the flavor of the day if that makes any sense that's yeah. probably not the perfect way to put but if yeah if what you're competing at are trends where like this is the new latest way to shake your ass for 20 seconds or something and yeah. like they never even saw your face in the video man you're just <laughs> shaking your ass like yeah I, um yeah but if you're making a thing that you mean and i have my shorthand for this between me and myself i have just i have called it bo burnham theory by now do you know this guy bo burnham i've heard of him of course yo so um just look at his, what do you call, it's not a discography. What would you call it if you're a comedian and you're really specials, whatever this resume of work he has is? Yeah. They're always, his specials are always like years apart. Wow. So let's take Make Happy came out in 2015. Or he shot it in 2015. Let's say it came out in 2016. I'm pretty sure the next damn thing that he made came out late in the pandemic and it was called Inside. Wow. Now look at the interim between 2016 and 2021. Find how many times he tweeted even, said anything to the internet to indicate that he exists, and it's not there. You know why? Because he was making his shit. And you know what? His thing came out in 2021 inside, and it's like the most acclaimed thing he ever made. Each new thing he made, he went deeper into his art and people loved it even more. They didn't abandon him because he has an identity. Like you said, he has a point of view and he had the patience to cultivate that and not put it down or be distracted because he was in a hurry. Trends came and went while he was working on that stuff. And he said, I, I know what I have to say and it's not going to change that. How do you think Bo Burnham in this case silences the voices that go, that come in when you haven't posted for a month, for two months, for three months that go, Oh, it's all gone. It's all the, the audience left. You know, you didn't. Oh, it, Bo Burnham did it, but he's huge. You know, you're a little, you're just a little pissant, you know? So when you go away, they really are going to forget about you. So might as well throw something up that you don't believe in. How do you think that? I don't know. I mean, how do you deal with that? How do you silence those, those, uh, whatever, that makes it easier, honestly. It's it's harder earlier on. Imagine putting something out. Let's see. For me, I think the last thing I put up was in July of 2020. Wow. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Three years and change um, ago. Um, and it went, dude, it was like so well received. That thing ended up winning a Webby. Um, <laughs> Yeah, just stuff that I'm like, uh, yeah, not me though. I, and, and you posted this like, in, okay, July of 2020. When when was the video that you posted before that? Uh, I put th that was in a little yo. I got. I must be careful of what words I choose here. Yeah, 2020 was a year of a lot of suffering for a lot of people, and 
it was um, fortuitously timed for me if we strictly look at it from the perspective of a, just me being a dude that was touring way too much. Yeah. And really burned out. Supremely mm. burned out, dude. Yeah. Um, with the traveling and the, the music that I was involved in at that time. But also I had, I was on these gnarly tours in 2019, playing these huge venues, filming all the time, no time to edit shit. Yeah. And so when I, when we all got told in March, like there's no more touring, you have to sit your ass at home. I did nothing for like 10 days to recuperate. I played like Metroid for 10 days, dude. Yeah. And then, I, but I played it with the commitment of, I know I'm going to screw around forever. I'm never going to work again. I had that sort of mindset. And then on day 11, the thing that I wanted to do the most was go edit this insane stuff that I'd shot in 2019. Mm. And so I, there was there was a pile of four videos that I, that I managed to finish because none of us yeah. in the touring world left the house. And so those came out in June and July of 2020. But the reason I give you that context is that's sort of misleading saying, yeah, I released four in a period of two months or something like yeah. that is not nor- at that well, time. Yeah, not normal I production the, for me. The important thing there is to rem- like you were you were making those videos for a year plus, you know? Yeah. And, and oh, years. Yeah. One was called a day in the, they were, it was, I had this series of videos called dude thoughts and one was called a day in the life of a studio musician. And one was called a day in the life of a road musician. And the studio one, that session was in May of 2018. Man. <laughs> and I released it two and a half uh, years after shooting it. Wow. It took me that long to just get to my desk and edit it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's still one of my favorite things I ever made because I meant it. Yeah. And, I, and so you were asking, how does Bo Burnham uh, silence his inner voice? I don't know. But if I if I put myself in those shoes, like the like you said, the, the piss ant version of those shoes, mm-hmm. um, I go... Well, as long as I mean it, it still is, I still um, mean it just as much in the summer of 2020 as I did in the spring of 2018 when I shot it. Yeah. So if I still mean it, I'm still going to say it. Yeah. And that's well, a, and, yeah. And do you think it's just a myth that the, that your audience will just move on? Dude, they will if the audience that you cultivated is the one that needed you to be the loudest, most colorful thing in that instant of scrolling. Mm-hmm. They will leave if that's how they got to you. How did they get to you? If they, if what drew them to you is that you ran your mouth for seven minutes about something sort of erudite, um, well then you, yeah, you've cultivated an o- audience with a different sort of attention span or yeah. something. And I didn't think that's what I was doing. When I was making videos. I just knew I, I, I was just making the stuff that I enjoyed consuming the most. Yeah. And that secret Island thing happened where, a hundred, I still have a screenshot on my channel when I had 24 subscribers and I didn't screenshot it going, look at this dinky YouTube. I went 24 people. Are these bots? Like (laughs) 24 people want to listen to this shit. I could not believe it. So I proudly screenshotted it, dude. Yeah. I still have that screenshot. So the idea that it's like, and and what's, how many subscribers do you have now on YouTube? Do you know? Some six digit number now. Dang. I don't even believe that as I say it out loud. They, (laughs) they carved a play, YouTube like carved a play button out of silver and sent it to my (laughs) house, dude. Like, because it's so many, however many hundred thousand or whatever signed up to. Yeah. And I still, yeah. Like, but, but I remember, um, I remember when I got to, a hundred or 500 or a thousand, a thousand is ridiculous. I don't even want to attribute this to a thousand. I remember having like, let's call it 500 subscribers and going, I can never make an excuse ever again. I can never try and compete for trends ever again because literally 500 people have opted into watching or listening if I just make something right now. So I don't need any new audience. I just need to take care of these 500. Mm. Imagine 500 people in this room right now. That's like, the windows would break, man. It'd be so loud in yeah. here. So I just knew that was enough. When it was 500, I knew that was enough. And, uh, and in hindsight, it becomes more obvious. If you take care of those 500, right? you think those are the only 500 in the world? That is, I'm comfortable with that thing spreading that way. Yeah. But it's so, it's such a, it's so beautiful, man. It's such a great sentiment. It's very like, you know, inspiring. I'm inspired by it. So I, I think that it's will be inspiring to a lot of people. Man, I well, yeah, I um, uh, I hope you can feel my enthusiasm for that 
to, yeah. cause I don't, yo, I have never walked around going like, Hey, everybody stop posting three things a day. I'm not trying to get in anybody's way, Yeah. but I am honored that you would point that out and ask about that, that you take notice to me taking several years at a time to put <laughs> something out. But when I do, it's, it's something I can live with. And I also, yo, I, I'm also so thankful to the people that watch my stuff. Like it has become a meme in the comments. If I do put something up now, this, the top several comments will be some creative variation of, um, Hey mom, wake up. Harry undied and has, <laughs> po and has posted a thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, and even the, you know, um, all the dude puns just working the word dude into places it doesn't belong. Like I've no, that when, by the time you have an audience that size, that starts to get a life of its own. Yeah. And whatever my dude pun generator is, is like, I cannot keep up with the people that are, watch my stuff have a better yeah. collective. Did you, yeah. was that like, uh, something that happened like the, the origin of, of dude, did that, was, was that like, uh, something you cooked up in a notebook somewhere or did that just sort of happen along the way? And I don't want to like ruin any magic behind it or anything like that. No, <laughs> dude, it can't be ruined because it's so, it's so sincere. I, and I understand what you're saying. I remember early on when that stuff kind of took hold yeah. for me and yo, in, in the airports and stuff, if people want a picture, rarely do they say, Hey, Harry, they can go. I get a picture? <laughs> they say it's the dude, <laughs> which I'd never asked for, but I, I understand where that came from, comes from because people that have known me since I was 13 yeah. refer to me the same way. I, like I've, I've said do it incessantly <laughs> for a long time. I have report cards from, you know, <laughs> middle school where they're like, this dude needs to stop saying dude. You know, it was like always yeah. before it became commodified as like a cartoon identity for me. Yeah. It just was my identity. Wow. And I can see why looking back, I can see why there are just back to the SEO people I, I have memories of being in conference rooms where they go, man, like introduce us to your team of marketing guys who came up with dude being your thing. What a lane, man. You guys really refined it or whatever. It's like, I, I looking at it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel lucky that, that it, I can, yeah, I can see in hindsight that's um, easy to retain. And if you were to draw in one stroke of a pencil, a caricature of me, of course, there would be a little shouting bubble that said dude or something. Yeah. And I, I didn't have that vision going forward. It's easier to connect those dots looking backwards, yeah. I think. Yeah, the part I've tried to stick to is just keep being the way that I am or something. Yeah, yeah. it's authentic, right? It's what everybody's trying to be anyway. Yeah, you dude. <laughs> <laughs> I ruined it. Well, uh, we're going to have to have you back at some point to talk about this whole this whole other facet of your life, which is like this touring part, which we haven't even gotten to. Um, but I, I do want to ask you, um, you know, and, and I, I think partly because we've talked about it before, but it's like, you could very easily, if you wanted to like be a YouTube drummer, content creator and like do that. But what I know and even just from listening to you, if I didn't know you previously, it's like, it was all in service of like this other thing, right? It was like the, the YouTube is actually like run off from this other thing that you're, that you do. And what is it about, um, playing the drum set live that like, you know, I think you've described it to me before as like, some sort of like spiritual higher calling, like playing the drums on stage. Right. So like what, what, uh, what is it for you that, 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 uh, makes you so excited about playing the drums? Is it, are you just chasing that same thing that, you know, you were chasing when you first found Blink-182? Is it, is it the vibes? <laughs> Man, <laughs> the vibes. What am I just going, yeah, it was the vibes. Yeah. At the end. Uh, this brings two things to mind, man. The first is that, I just want to, I just want to say it before your YouTube commenters say it. While you were asking me that question, <laughs> I was trying to hydrate and not all of the water went in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that this is on camera. Well, and I'm at we'll the just mercy. edit over here. Okay. It'll be fine. 
I'm at the mercy of your editors. They could, yeah, they could just, I mean, you were the one talking, so the camera should be on you. But it, they could, be it. it should be on They me. could zoom in and go slow-mo, and there will be footage of water going. Right, well, we're going to have to put that in. So. Down the side of me. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to address that and cut myself down before you all cut me down first. <laughs> um, I still welcome the cut downs, but yeah. I just want you to know that I know. That's the first thing that brings to mind. The second thing is... Dude, you're you're right. I I love that you and I have this background of playing music on stage together. Yeah, when you, we when we met, you were just like it was like this other guy. Evan was like, "Hey, this guy plays drums." It's like, okay, cool. I think we drove to like Virginia, and that was like the first time we ever met. And uh, yeah, so like obviously we spent a lot of time on the road just talking, and that's. I like slowly uncovered this deep well that is Harry, you know, <laughs> but is, I didn't know it at the time. Yo, but this is, I sense that this is your relationship with all people. Cause that, you know, maybe, uh, the, the world at large hears you talking on this podcast and they go, well, yeah, this is podcast Troy, but, um, yo, Troy is this way all the time. <laughs> right. I'm very curious. Ride down the highway to Roanoke, Virginia with Troy. Yeah. And you will be on your own episode of CNN 60 Minutes, dude. <laughs> You're so inquisitive, man. And I not ask a just, lot of questions. Yeah, for it's, sure. it's not just how's it going. It's like, now unpack that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so this is, in that sense, this is such a natural, this is like every conversation we ever had, man. <laughs> yeah, A is. little lopsided because I am, am constantly uh, resisting the temptation to ask you questions. Yeah. But that's on your episode of 10 Year Town, dude, when you've been here for 10 years. All right. We'll, uh, we'll work our way there. Um, the, but speak, yo, this all relates to what you're asking. Yeah. Yes, there is a primal, just the feeling of, I don't know if you like chopping down a tree or something like. Mm -hmm. Yo, the physical feedback of chopping the hell out of a drum and just being a Viking. I can actually feel today, I can feel that I have some sort of damage in my vocal cords because I just did three shows in a row with Hardy this weekend. Yeah. And there's so much yelling going on stage <laughs> that I'm kind of hoarse on Sundays and Mondays. Wow. Because we're fucking Vikings, man. Like I yeah. Him especially. He sets that tone and the rest of us just start... He just starts yelling and running somewhere and the rest of us just pick up random objects and just start yelling and running up the hill too. And we don't know why. Like that's the kind of leader that Hardy is. Yeah. And that's what he brings out of all of us. But yo, I feel that's how I play the drums. I, everywhere I ever played in my life, I was always told I was playing too loud. Mm. And he's the first one that ever went like, can you play louder? That's sick. Uh, yeah, I just feel like I've arrived in paradise, man. Yeah. But, um, yo, so there is that primal feedback thing, just as a basic organism mm -hmm. that nothing in my life has felt the way that the that the drums have felt. In that. Even just that, that, like, tactile, like, this hitting the tom. Yes, that's number one, what I'm saying. Mm. Yeah, I don't, I'm breaking 12 sticks a night or something. And, and the moment that we have all this footage of this, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. The moment they explode is that, is that, um, that sort of release of like, I have, I have vanquished a drumstick Dang. In, in pursuit of this. It's powerful, bro. I love that. Fucking 15,000 people in here. And yeah. it just sort of, everybody broke at the same time that the stick broke. Yeah. I'm feeling that every night and that. I really actually think is an addiction. Mm. And sometimes I, because I know that even the most fortunate musicians in the world, they are like we said about the sine wave, we are passing through a moment. Mm -hmm. I'm in constant recognition of that and trying not to grip it like that. I'm just trying to accept it like that. Yeah. But, uh, that, but it, look, it is an addiction that feels good. But, um, I, I am also more and more in touch with, the way I honestly think always for me, the most important thing about music for me has been the sense of, I don't even want to say the word belonging, but the, the gateway to connection that gives us with one another. The reason you and I know each other is because you played this instrument and sang your songs and I played this instrument. And that's why we had all these ridiculous conversations about the fort that they thought they built in America, <laughs> but they accidentally built it in Canada. Fort Montgomery, dude. Fort yeah. Blunder. Yeah, dude. Most of our relationship is Fort <laughs> Blunder. We didn't actually spend that much time playing music, but oh. that was the, dude, that's what got us there. And so I, when I play music, I f am so mindful of, I don't even want to use the word brotherhood because I've, 
been in, you know, I've had, um, played with just as many female artists that I feel that same kind of ridiculous yeah. connection to, whatever that is. I just feel like I'm part of a village, man. And so the drums, sometimes people want to, I feel bad. Sometimes people want to ask me about the drums. What is this drum made out of? I go, I don't know. <laughs> I, Cause it wasn't the point. I drum, I don't really think about the drums that much. Yeah. It just happens to be my little, um, uh, monopoly token that I have on that, on that board. Yeah. That's but the point is being on the board with all the other monopoly tokens. Yeah. That's your, that's the job that, that you had a whatever predisposition for doing. And that kind of got you in the game. Yeah, man. And, uh, the game is, it's the best part, dude. Yeah. You know, uh, the I've, journey, man. I feel very in touch with that right now. And, and so lucky for that. Yeah. I would, um, we, uh, I would talk to you as long as you want about true. Cause you, dude, you're right. Thank you for the recognition of this. I remind myself every January one, I rewrite all my goals for the year. I yeah. take inventory of the ones that I, um, hopefully vanquished the year before or fell short on. Mm. I, that's like an important part too. And then I reevaluate for the next year. And it's the same document that I've had for 10 years. And so in that document, I can see all the goals that I've written for the last 10 years. And one thing that I have to read every January one, when I read this document, almost like when you go to AA or something, they make you, um, they read the same text out loud over and over again and everybody knows it by heart, but, uh, that doesn't matter. It's still new every time. Does that mm -hmm. make any sense? Mm -hmm. And so likewise in this, this little goals document that I have, I read over and over again. Um, I believe YouTube is best done as a hobby. Hmm. Don't YouTube in the pursuit of money. You're saying, and by the way, I'm speaking to myself. I'm not trying to give anybody advice here. Yeah. I'm, I'm referring to a document written from me to me that says YouTube is a hobby. Like you said, it's in service of let it, let it be a harmony ingredient to what I actually wanted to do, which was play the drums. Yeah. When I went to that YouTube awards thing or whatever, and they, they give you the play button carved out of silver, I met some stressed out mother effers, man, <laughs> because that, that award show was like on a Sunday and Tuesday was like content day for everybody. And they're like, yeah. I don't know what I'm going to shoot. And they're just pointing their phones at weird looking trees on the red carpet or whatever, going like, maybe this is my content for Tuesday. And I thought that is when the, uh, the outcome became the point instead of the, the thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel really religiously about avoiding that state of being at all costs and the stuff that I make. So you're right. It's just, it's a crispy piece of lettuce on the burger, man. What's the burger for you? Drumming. Just M must, drumming. must play music with my dudes. Yeah. That's it. I'm love it, dude. Yeah. You and I know a lot of ambitious people that are like, no, I have to also own a clothing line and stuff. Like I don't have that in me, man. I, I, I love this. I, I'm so thankful I'm on tour right now mm. playing the drums. That was the whole point. And so the fact that there were years in my life where YouTube made more money for me than playing the drums is insane. It wasn't the point, but, and I'm thank, I'm thankful for it, but, uh, I, I don't want to let that entice me into being like, Oh, maybe I am a YouTuber. I don't want to ever refer to myself that way. I, I'm a drummer. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. I love it. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we're going to have to have you back to talk about the touring part. Cause mm -hmm. I feel like we mostly talked about the YouTube, but dude, thank you for being here. Uh, you're the man. And that's it. That's the pod. See you later. Thanks everybody for listening. Keep rating, keep reviewing, keep subscribing. We love you. Talk to you soon. Bye.